morning once again. Welcome everyone. We're so glad you're with us here on this long weekend. So many of us, God bless you. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn please to Matthew 25. I said Bibles and not uh, phones. <laughs> I'm still old-fashioned that way, I guess. I, I guess I, that's one old-fashioned I want to stay with, I'll be honest with you. I struggle with the phones. I, my goodness, but anyway. Matthew 25, please. We've been studying the teachings of Jesus for several months, and we are concluding this Sunday and next Sunday. We'll be looking at two parables, and then from that, we'll be looking into the life of David. But we are looking at two very important parables this morning and next Sunday. Matthew 25 will begin... Verse number 14, please. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two to another one, to every man according to his several abilities, and straightway took the journey. Then he that received five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of the servants cometh and reckoneth uh, with them. And so he that hath received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that hath received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. And his Lord said unto them, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he that hath received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. And his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money, noticed my money, in to the, the exchangers, and that thou at my coming I should have received mine own usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which, and cast into the unprofitable servant unto the utter darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. We have a very powerful message this morning. We've been studying the teachings of Jesus. Jesus is the master teacher. We've been looking at his life. We've been looking at the Beatitudes, the parables. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the parable here called the talents. Now, we need to understand by way of introduction that these parables are part of an answer to a question that the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24. So, George, can you give me Matthew 24, uh, the ver first three verses 
I just want to paint the picture for you so we understand what Jesus is saying here. And Jesus went out, departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said unto him, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left one stone upon another that thou shalt not be thrown down. Verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came and privately said, Tell us, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And now Jesus is going to answer this question. What is the sign of your coming and the end of the world? What's going to be happening during this time? And so Jesus now answers this question with certain parables. And we're looking at one of them this morning. I've entitled this message, Buried Treasure. Buried treasure. My premise is that Jesus and the emphasis of this teaching is that while we are waiting, we should be working. For God has called us to occupy until he comes. And so we're going to be looking at this premise. What does it mean while we are waiting, we should be working? Notice in our text in verse number 14, we get a chance, that the story centers around an estate and this owner of an estate who goes on a far journey. All this is a picture of Jesus. Jesus owns this kingdom his kingdom, and he's on a far journey. He has gone away. He's gone to heaven, but he's coming back. And so this owner of this estate is on a journey, and he asks his servants to take the responsibility to do something while he's gone. These three servants are a picture of the church. You are the church. I am part of the church. And all of these servants, these three different servants, represent the church. Certain individuals in the church. And they are given talents. Talents was a form of money or a degree of money. A denomination of money. One talent back in that day was 600 denaries. One denarii was worth one day wage to an average worker. So one talent in today's terms, was approximately a half a million dollars. One talent, a half a million dollars in today's terms, more or less, give or take a few thousand. And so this estate owner gives a tremendous amount of money for them to take care of his business, the owner's business, while he is gone. Do you see the parallels that Jesus is making to the church? Jesus is gone, and now he's given the responsibility of his affairs to the church. Friends, do you and I, do you realize that you have a responsibility? That's not the pastor's responsibility. It's not the evangelist's responsibility. It's not the prophet's responsibility. You have a responsibility you who represents the servant, you the church, have a responsibility while Jesus is gone to do something with what he's given you. If you are a Christian this morning, you're called to do something. You're called to do something because he's given you something. And so we want to talk about this morning, this, this is a very important message. And important because I believe if we understand the reality of what Jesus is trying to teach us, it will change our lives. And so this estate owner, he's gone. And he wants us to invest. He wants us to invest in his business while we are gone. He wants us to invest in his kingdom while we are gone as if he was here on earth. So he wants us to do something here on earth as if Jesus, the owner of this estate, was living physically just right beside you next door. You know, Paul gives us powerful scripture in Ephesians. says, don't serve God with eye service. Interesting. Don't serve God with eye service. And what Paul was saying to the Ephesians is, don't pretend you're doing spiritual work only when I'm around you so you can be seen of men. But do it when nobody's looking. See, that principle applies here. You are 
and I are to work for this kingdom as if Jesus was living physically before us. Because we have been given an assignment. And the success of this assignment is based on you and me willing to do something with what God has given. It's you personally. It's not somebody else's responsibility. It's your responsibility. And this is very, very important because we love to blame others or shift responsibility to other people, don't we? And so the point is, Jesus, the owner of this estate, is now gone. Jesus said in John 14, I am going to a place that I've prepared for you. But don't worry about it because I'm coming back to get you. And so in that period of time, Jesus is waiting on you and me to do something while he's gone. And he gives us this instruction a little bit later on in the Gospels where Jesus tells us to occupy while he's gone. You see, friends, one day God will ask of us to give an account of what we did on earth while he was gone. And that's a very sobering thought. Every day has significance in your life. Every single day is important. That's why Paul tells us in Ephesians to redeem the time. You have a responsibility for Don't waste it. Every day can make a difference in somebody's life. Every day is important. Even while you're washing the dishes. Even while you're waking up. and you're, Every single moment has significance. If you understand what the principle that we're going to be learning this morning. And so the question is. What are we doing with the time that God has given us, with the investment and the talents that he's given us? Because everybody has a talent. And all of us are going to be held responsible as we face them because Hebrews tells us it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Not the judgment of salvation, although that's true for many, but the judgment seat of Christ. We will be held accountable with what God has given us. And that is very, very important. And all of the abilities that God has given us to invest in his kingdom has been given for a purpose. Either we are investing for his kingdom or not. And that is a decision that you have to make every single day. And so there's four principles I want to share with you as we begin our study this morning. This is like a teaching. I've been doing some teaching lately. And there'll be another teaching next Sunday. But I trust that the Lord will speak to us while we are looking at the teachings of Christ. I want you to notice, number one, principles that end with T-Y. First of all, these talents that God has given us, now this is money, but it's also your abilities. So talents, as it speaks for itself, is your ability, but it's also financially what God has given you as well. It's twofold. The talents that God has given you are given according to God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. He chooses to bless you as he will. You are not blessed because you can earn it or because you just have a certain uh, a disposition. God's sovereignty. God chooses who to bless the way he wants to bless. It's all because of his sovereignty. George, give me verse 15, please. Give me verse number 15. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two talents, to another one talents, to every man according to his servant ability. So what does that mean? God chooses according to your ability, to what God has given you. This is God's prerogative. It's not earned. God has done it. It's his providence. It's his choice. So don't blame anybody. Don't, it, God has given it. It's all about what God gives. It's God's sovereignty. It's what he wants us to have. Every good gift comes from above. James chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 tells us what you have, you have received from God. Everything is about what God gives. So it's because of God's sovereignty. Then number two, these talents are given according to our ability or our capacity. The capacity of the servant. The servant's ability to function. So that servant is without excuse. Let me break it down for you. If he's given you five talents, then you can use those five talents. 
It's in your DNA. You can't say, well, I'm not able to do that. That's not true. He's given you five talents. You can use it. You can do it because God has blessed you with it. You can't say, wait a minute, God, you've asked me to reproduce five talents, but I've only got two. That's not true. God gave you five talents because he put in you the capacity to do the five talents and to perform whatever God's given you in the ability that God's given you to see a multiplication of 10 if he's given you five. So it's because of the capacity he's given you. So you're not with that, you're with no excuse. If you're not called to be an evangelist, God will not ask you to, uh, to, to do that work, although we're all called to evangelize. I'm talking about the office of evangelism. There's no way, because you don't have the capacity for it. So God cannot bring into, into judgment if you don't produce the fruit of evangelism as far as the office is concerned. Because you don't have that capacity. But whatever capacity God's given you, or ability, then you will be held accountable for it. So if, you can, if you're called to the ministry, and you just don't want to minister, you will be held accountable for that. If you're called to do something for Christ, and he's given you the capacity, but you're too lazy, or you're too fearful, God will hold you accountable to that. Number three. Then these talents were given according to uh, the uh, um, uh, opportunity. These talents were given for the opportunity to bring honor to God. You see, God has blessed you not so you can inherit the blessings, although that's certainly a byproduct of that. But God has given you gifts so you can use those gifts for his glory. God has given you those gifts so he you can use those gifts for his glory. He's not giving you those gifts so you can spend it on yourself and live it up. Some of you have great gifts and you're using it for yourself. Some of you have got brilliant minds and you're using it for your own work, for your own resources and for your own privileges. And God is saying, I've given you that so you can use it for my kingdom. And that's where we get into trouble, you see. How many gospel singers, Jermaine, do you know, maybe personally, or that you heard of, who started in the church worshiping God? They were the greatest gospel singers, and now they're singing in the world. They have forsaken their roots. They've taken what God has given them, and they've exploited it to their own lust and their own desires. And that goes for a lot of things in life. God has given you those gifts for the opportunity to glorify God with them. And there are opportunities everywhere. Please don't come to me and say, well, Pastor Dino, I don't have any. If God has given you a gift for something, I can assure you the doors will open so those gifts will be exercised. That's just the way it is. That's what Proverbs tells us. If God has called you, he will open the door so you can enter through that door. I can assure you of that. It will happen. It may not happen the way you want it to happen. But if God has called you and ordained you, then those opportunities will come. It's as simple as that. Don't try to kick a door down when God's not opening it. In other words, if God's given you the capacity for it, the opportunity will come. But if he's not giving you the capacity and you want that capacity but it doesn't come from God, those doors won't open. When I was in Bible college, I met a guy who wanted to be a preacher. He thought there was something glorious about preaching. And there is, spiritually. He thought there was something glamorous. Oh, you know, I want to I wanna do this and I want to try and I want to have a baby. And he kind of got a warped concept. He thought that there was something, you know, glamorous about being a preacher. I was going to try to set him straight, you know, but God set him straight before I did. <laughs> he didn't last. He left school because he wasn't called to be a preacher. See, if God's called you for something, he will give you the capacity and the opportunities will come. And you will have to make decisions. Am I going to do this or not? The opportunities will come for you to bear fruit. Notice, even the least of these servants still had a half a million dollars to invest. So please don't feel sorry for them. 
Then number four, these talents that were given by the owner to the servants, the servants, as a result, had the responsibility to maximize what they received from the owner. When God gives you these talents, your responsibility is not just to, to, to do them, but to maximize. In other words, I'm going to set it straight, to do your best. What did Jesus say? Hereby is my Father glorified that ye bear fruit, that ye bear much fruit, to maximize. We're not just called to get by. We're called to do our best, to bear much fruit. If you just want to get by, so be it. But that's not what God's called. God's called you to maximize what he's given you. Five becomes ten. A hundred percent increase. See, God's called you to be fervent in his service. All of us have been called to be fervent. Don't blame your personality and say, well, you know, I'm not really geared that way. Fervency's got nothing to do with person. You can be very quiet and be very fervent. Can I hear an amen? And you can be very loud, type A, boisterous and gregarious and look fervent, but you're not. You're dead as a doorknob. You cannot base fervency on personality. I know people are very loud, but they're not fervent. You are called to maximize what, what God's given you. And so what are we learning so far? That the owner gave the talents to these three servants for what purpose? They had a responsibility to maximize what they were given. They had the opportunity to share and to make an increase. They had the capacity, in other words, the ability. They couldn't blame that they didn't have the giftings. They did. And it was because of God's sovereignty. God chose to give five to him, two to him, and one to him. That's just God's Sovereignty, but in his sovereignty, he gave you the ability to do it. So in other words, brothers and sisters, we are without excuse. That's my point. We're all going to face God. And we will not stand before him and say, but Lord, I didn't have the chance or I couldn't. And, you know, I wasn't able to, you know, brother, sister, and so-and-so always did that, you know, and it doesn't work with God that these things don't, you know, it's too cold outside and, you know, Lord, winter was coming and I, I wasn't, you know, it doesn't work like that. We all have this responsibility to maximize. Hereby is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. Much fruit. Much fruit. Much fruit. And so we are to invest it for him. That we are his servants. We are to be involved. Now watch this. Here's the point. Watch this. If we are all stewards, watch this now, then nothing is truly ours. Uh oh, I'm going to get deep tonight. This is going to, this is going to hurt someone. I hope it does. hope it hurts a lot of us in, in a good way. If we are servants and stewards, then everything we think we own, we don't. It's just on loan. Oh boy. Here we go now. You see, if it's on loan, it's not yours. The problem is we as Christians believe we live in this world and what we have is truly ours. It's not. It's been given to us. Well, Pastor, you know, hold on a second. I'm the one that gets up at five in the morning. I sweat. I, I, I'm the one that works hard. I, yeah, I know all that. But God has given you the ability. You see... We need to be very careful that in this estate called the world, that we don't think that what we have comes from us alone. Because if you do, you'll never be able to fulfill the commission that God has given you. Yes. It's not ours. My life is not my own. Didn't we just sing it before? To you I belong. I give myself, I give myself, I surrender all to you. Because 
it's not mine, you see. Everything I give to you, withholding nothing. It's not mine. Why are you holding on to it? Withholding nothing. I give myself away so you can use. That song's got great theology. The Bible tells us that God has given us power to get wealth. God has given us power to do things. It is God's power. Everything belongs to God. Even the tithes we give. Our tithes aren't even ours. We should have no problem giving if it's really of the Lord because it's God's money anyway. It's all God's. We need, and many times God will test us in our willingness to give what is not ours to him when it belongs to him anyway. You see, God is not a convenience. God is a necessity. And when we understand that everything comes from God, that we have a responsibility to maximize what God has given us for him. See, only a true believer can understand this. See, the Lord is saying, look, look, I'm letting you use these gifts for a period of time. So I want you to redeem this time. Don't waste time. Don't waste time. If you're physically not able to do something, pray at least. Don't waste time. How many people go through days of days and they don't pray? They're doing everything else. But they're not maximizing what God has given them. They don't witness. They don't talk about Jesus. They don't share his love. They go through weeks and weeks of just living their own lives. Or well, they might come to church on occasion, but... They're not maximizing what God's given them. They're wasting time. And you know, I got to pause because sometimes Jesus will say, listen, I need your car for a few weeks. I need your house for something. It's not yours, but I've, I've given it to you, but, but I need it anyway. I've let you live in here, but I need it for a period of time. Are you... Are you willing to let me have it? Oh, <clears throat> hold on now a second, God. I mean, uh, do you remember Abraham when finally after 25 years he had his baby? Crying out day after day for a child. Finally after 25 years. In the pride and the joy of Isaac being born, God comes to him and says, listen, Abraham, I'm glad. All of, but I, you better go sacrifice it. Uh, but Lord, you can't. Yeah, just go and sacrifice. What was God doing? God was testing him. Do you love Isaac more than you do me? Sometimes God will tell us, give me your Isaac. I'm just testing to see where your priorities are. I'm just testing to see if you really love me. I'm just testing to see if you're a true sir. I'm just testing to see if you've taken ownership of what I've given you. Hallelujah. And Abraham passed with flying colors. And so, that happens on occasion. But the purpose and the key is, and I want you to say, that while we are waiting for Jesus to return, we need to be working, two W's. While we are waiting, we are working. While we are waiting, we are working. And so what is the response? What happens when Jesus finally meets these three servants after he comes back, the owner? Notice, please, verse number 16. Watch this now. Watch this. Verse number 16. And then, he that hath received five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Keep going. And likewise, he that hath received two talents also gained other two talents. Verse 18. But he that received one went and dug it in the earth and hid it from the Lord's money. Notice his Lord's money. Notice his Lord's money. Notice what? His Lord's money. Not our money. Not his money. His Lord's money. Notice those who had five and two talents were really excited when the master came back. They were all excited because they made interest. They made gain. One was miserable when his master came back. 
two of them were excited. One of them was extremely discouraged. Let me ask you, when Jesus comes back, how are you going to feel? When Jesus comes back, are you going to be excited? Now just think about it. How many people are really worried about that? I've talked to some of us here. Not, 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 not so much here so much. I've talked to a few. But I've talked to people over the years. And when it comes to the coming of the Lord and the Christian judgment seat and how we're going to appear before the Lord and we're going to give an account, and not everybody's really, ex not many are really excited about that. There are a few. But you see, when you're really obeying the word of the Lord and you're bearing fruit for God, you're going to be excited. You can't wait. You're going to be able to sing, what a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day, glorious day. That see, there's going to be excitement. But for some, there's going to be a lot of apprehension and maybe a lot of fear. One man who hid his talent wasn't so excited. Jesus is a master teacher. He teaches a lot with contrasts, if you notice. A lot of the teachings I presented to you these last few months, you'll notice in every teaching there seems to be a contrast so we can learn from one perspective against another. We see a contrast. One is excited, uh, two are excited, and one is not so excited. One was playing it safe, he thought. The others took a risk and stepped out. And he's saying... I'm going to make sure when my master comes back that I'm going to get it back. You see, during this time, there was no real bank vaults. There was no, you know, it didn't really operate like we do today. And so he hid it in the ground and he buried it. How many people just take the gifts that God has given them and bury it? I know people who've got gifts and they've buried it. Oh, they're great thinkers though. Oh, they can analyze a lot of things. They're great academics. Oh, well, you know, this hasn't been crossed. The T is still not. The I hasn't been dotted over here. And we're thinking and we're rationalizing and we're going through internal debates, uh, trying to figure out this and that thing. And meanwhile, you're not redeeming the time. Meanwhile, you have buried the gift that God has given you. It's under the ground and you're just waiting for the right thing and, the, and it's never coming to pass. And you're just going around and you're still not doing what God's called you to do. Listen, folks, if God's given you a gift and you know it, don't look for the ideal situation to come up because, and it might, but just begin to do what God's called you to do. I knew God was calling me to preach. I didn't know what that meant when I first, I never, I never been to church, but I felt this, this need, this impulse to speak about God and I didn't know what, even what that meant. I never really... I watched television. I maybe once saw Billy Graham on television with my father. He dragged me into the room to watch this. I, did, I only stayed about 30 seconds. I, I, but when I got saved, I, was, I wasn't in church for several, several months. But when I got saved, I felt this urgency to preach. And I said, what, what, what's going on here? And I remember I was reading the Bible and I was in Los Angeles. And the Lord would just lead me on the streets to preach. Can you imagine that? No pastor came up and told me, all right, Dino, here's how you do things. You got to follow this format. You got to, you know, do that. You got to have an introduction. You got to have a body and you got to get an inclusion. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you got to use illustrations over here. You got, what? I just preached. Amen. I just opened my mouth and let God take over. Because I knew I was called. I didn't wait for somebody to come. Oh, hi, Dino. I just flew all the way from Phoenix, Arizona, because I knew God had called you to preach, and I've come here to bring you to the biggest church at Phoenix. What? I just did what God's called me to do. I didn't start making all this, you know, prerequisites. So if God's going to use me, then this has got to happen. You know, like some of us, well, Lord, when I get married, you know, she's got to be... You know, like this and like that, and he's got to have this and she's got to have that. You know, you don't make lists for God. I made no lists for God.
I just did what I believed God wanted me to do. And God took me from one level to the next. I won my first soul on the streets that very same day that God called me to preach. Imagine that. And I knew that God was calling me. Did I preach behind a pulpit? No. The streets were my pulpits. The highways and byways were my pulpits. The restaurants were my pulpits. See, when God's called you, don't expect everything just to fall into place right away. God will make a way. But he'll prepare you. Remember with David, he didn't fight Goliath the same day, did he? He prepared David with a lion and a bear. And after the lion and the bear, he was able to deal with Goliath. Amen. There was a process. Amen. And so two of them were excited for the master's return, and one of them was not. And three things Jesus says. Notice here in verse 21, 23, George. Watch this now. Three things here. I'll give you three C's very quickly. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Wow. Three things. Notice this. He addresses two of the three servants. Number one, he gives them, uh, he commends them. There's commendation. Well done, he says. You've done well, he says. Number two, there's promotion. Keep going, George. Verse 23 and 24. He that hath received one, reaping, gathering, Thou hast not strut. And so, notice now, there's promotion, and then there's invitation. What happens? He tells them, come and enter. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I will make you ruler over many nations. And so, there's an invitation, there's commendation, and there's promotion. They're blessed. We see three things happening. Again, I repeat, he commends them. He promotes them and he invites them. Well done. I will make you ruler. There's the promotion. And I want you now come and enter into the joy. Come to heaven. There's promotion. Three wonderful things that happened to these two servants. They both got the same reward. There was no difference. Five or two talents. They got the same reward. Why? Because it's all based on faithfulness. Faithfulness. It's all not based necessarily on ability, but availability. Faithfulness. 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 Mother Teresa, when she was approached by a reporter that made fun of her about poverty, says, Mother Teresa, I says, you haven't been successful in wiping up the poverty with all these orphans, haven't you? She looked at him and said, Sir, God hasn't called me to be successful, but he's called me to be faithful. Yes. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. They were faithful to the end. They set out to invest these gifts and they were fruitful and they've all received, these two servants, a 100% interest gain because they were active and they were willing to continue to persevere. Now I got to pause for a second before I move on to my next point. Watch this now. Very important. You see, these two investors were were, I can use the word successful, because they were faithful, yes, but because they were also willing to take a risk. You can never produce or reproduce if you play it safe. How many Christians, maybe even in this room, all you do is you sit in the pew, and that's what you do. Sunday after Sunday, you sit right here, and you listen to a sermon, and you go home. I'm glad you're here, don't get me wrong, but you're not reproducing very much. 
That's not what God has called you to do. Attending church service is wonderful, but there's more to your Christian walk than sitting Sunday morning and hearing this man speak. If that's all there is, I need to talk with you. You see, the other two investors stepped out. They got involved. They took a risk. You can't get a home run in baseball if you don't swing the bat. Too many Christians are holding on to the bat, so to speak, but you're not swinging it. You're making all kinds of excuses. I, well, you know, it's not the right time, and I don't have the, you know, and I'm not sure, and, and we're all playing it safe, and we're never stepping out, and you wonder why you don't have joy in your life. Amen. If you're going to maximize what God's given you, it's going to take a risk. You're going to have to get out of the boat. Stop trying to make your Christianity a nice, safe little bubble. I tell you folks, Jesus has not called us to play it safe. He called us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's going to take risk because some people won't want to even hear you. It's going to take risk because sometimes you're going to be in a tough situation. You got to step out of that comfort zone. You see, the one that had one talent didn't want to take a risk. He played it safe and he buried his gift. How many Christians are burying their gift in the earth? And so, there needs to be some kind of risk for there to be gain. Somebody's got to step out for there to be gain. Look, anyone could just stumble and find this investment in the ground as that man buried it. He could have been, they could have found the money. He was lazy and slothful. He didn't take a risk. He just wanted to play safe, safe. How many pitches safe? I want to play it safe. Playing it safe will really hurt you, friends. You're not, listen, if you're playing it safe, you'll never truly enter into what God's called you to do. Because no matter who it is in this world, and, and, and years ago, back then and today, anybody who ever did anything for God always got out of the boat. And so finally, they are summoned. That's a picture of judgment, Hebrews 9. To justify himself, the man with one talent said, verse 24 and 25, says, well, I knew that you're a hard man, you know. You're hard to please, so I buried it, he said. Notice, then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I know, imagine that, I know you that you're a hard man. My goodness. How many people blame God for certain situations and you just blame God? Well, you're just, you're hard. You're just, you know, you're a hard man reaping where thou hast not. You know, I don't understand what you're doing really. You're just a hard man, he says. But the truth is he didn't trust him. He didn't trust his master's words. Man's motive was wrong. He was full of fear. Out of fear, he buried his gift. No risk. Some say he was lazy. No passion, no hunger. And Jesus calls him, you are wicked. Imagine that. What a contrast from the others. The contrast continues. He said, well done to the others, thou faithful. He calls him wicked, wicked, wicked. His heart wasn't right. And you know, when your heart's not right, you blame others so quickly. The point is, we must not take what God has given us and do whatever we want to do and waste it and bury it. It will be fatal. He wasted it. He buried it. You see, what we do with what God has given us is so important. And what we do not use, we will lose. What we do not use, we will lose. Notice the Bible says, give to the one who made five extra, ten. Give him that talent. He gave it away to somebody else. 
How many people are doing work here today and other places, but you're doing it on somebody else's gift that nobody used and God has given you an extra one? Why do you think 80% of the people in the church do nothing? Only 20% carry the load. That's statistics. 80% of the people in the church do nothing. Only 20% of the people. Only 20%. The 80% are not doing very much. And the 20% are tired. And they're probably using other people's gifts that God has given it because God can trust you. Because when you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. Oh, can I say that again? Yes. You like that one? That's for free, by the way. You want to have something done? Give it to someone who's busy. That's why he's busy. When someone's not busy, it's because nothing's being done. Oh, I know this wasn't an amen sermon, Jeremy. Uh, that's okay. I don't need amens. I, I don't need amens. I got to close. It's one o'clock. I got I to gotta close. I got so much here. I don't know. All right. Application as I close. Application, application, application. What do we learn? What do we learn? Number one, freely you have received, freely you must give. Freely you have received, freely you must give. See, what you do with what you have will be the basis of your judgment. Don't blame that you don't have it. Did David blame that he had only a rock to kill Goliath with? Did David say, wait a minute, Mr. Goliath, you're too big. I don't, you're just too big. What did David use? A lousy little pebble. Excuse me? What did Shamgar use? By the way, those are going to come to judges to study judges. You probably don't know who Shamgar is. I won't tell you till you come to my study. All I can tell you is that Shamgar used the whip to beat 600 Philistines. What did Shamgar have? A whip. What? What did Samson use to destroy a thousand Philistines? A thousand spears? A jawbone of a donkey. Last time I checked, that's not a very good weapon. <laughs> Me, friend, what are you using? What excuses are you making? Well, Lord, all I have is... Don't be fooled, friends. God can do so much with one stone. One stone. Moses, what's in your hand? Well, well Lord, I just have this, this kind of, you know, this, this, this measly, this rod. I mean, it's just a, a nothing rod. A rod. Moses, stretch that rod right now. Stretch that rod. But Lord, it's just a rod. Stretch it. Oh, okay, Lord. I'll st and all of a sudden, the Niles turned into blood. Something that's ordinary in the hands of God becomes extraordinary, my friend. You can believe that. Number two. Number two, number two, number two. We are called to be active, to be fervent. Not only freely have you received freely, but we're called to be fervent, fervent, fervent. The effectual fervent prayer. Be fervent in spirit, Paul says. It means to be on fire. Jesus said, be zealous, be zealous, Jesus said in Revelation to the earth. It means to be boiling, boiling water, to boil. David said, enlarge my heart that I might run to you. Speaks of fire. Paul says, whatever you do, you do it wholeheartedly. Speaks of fire. We're called to be people of fire, people of fervency. Don't ever tell me that you can't have that passion because it's not your personality. That's a lie. You can be fervent without saying a word. Number three. Then we are going to be judged not by the amount of talents we have. Oh, I wish I had more. Oh, I wish I could sing like Jermaine or like, or like, uh, like, like Debbie or, or like, uh, or like, uh, uh, anybody else? I'm just kidding. There's quite a few, there's quite a few of us. I'm just joking. I don't, that, 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 that came out wrong. Hold on a second. I don't want to have letters. That came out wrong. You know what I mean? Oh, I wish I can this and I wish I can that. Stop wishing. God's giving you something. Just use it. Just use it. 
because you're going to be judged not by the amount of gifts, but the faithfulness of your gift. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. The faithfulness of that gift. If it's one or two, it doesn't matter. That's what's going to be judged. He that endures to the end, occupy it. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Faithfulness so we can hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Freely you have received, freely you give. Fervent in spirit, occupy it. Fruitful. And be faithful. Faithful in what's given you. Whatever it is, one, two, three, five, six, doesn't matter. Be faithful with what God's given you. That's the basis. Faithfulness. I want to close with a true story. Many years ago, the president of a CEO, and president and CEO of a company, he got older and it was time for him to resign. He didn't have any children, so he wanted to give his company over to Three servants, three workers in his company that he thought would be appropriate. Good, good, good candidates. And so to test them, he brought them up. And he brought them in front of all the people. Some kind of, he was a bit of an extremist, but there he was. And he brought these three servants, these three workers in front of the whole company. And he gave these servants, what, this is a true story, seeds in their hands to plant. And for three months, they're going to come back in front of all the people and they're going to be assessed who will be the next CEO. Can you imagine that? No, no resume, nothing. This was the criteria. This is a true story. Again, I keep repeating it. After three months, they were to appear. Well, one man, we'll call him Jim, really struggled with this. He went home and he planted his seeds in this pot that he got, he got seen, he was supposed to plant them in the pot and they were supposed to grow after three months. Well, he had a real hard time because these seeds would not grow. He watered them and watered them and put more soil in. He tried to nurture them and even his wife said, well, you forget about these seeds. Go buy new seeds and, and get, get. He, obviously there's something wrong with these seeds. He says, no, I'm going to stay true to what the boss told me. I'm just going to keep trying to water them until they grow. Now, anyway, three months had passed. They're all presented in front of the boss. We'll call the boss Bob. And so there's Bob, and there's all the people as witnesses. They're all coming, these three men. Two of the three men had great, beautiful flowers. Gorgeous flowers and plants. Beautiful! Jim had nothing. Just a pot. And the CEO was there. Everybody's looking, what's going on here? Bob, the CEO, goes directly to Jim. He says, Jim, what's going on here? He says, I'm sorry, sir, I tried to grow uh, what you gave me, these seeds, but, and I was told to get new seeds, but I didn't want to be dishonest with what you gave me. He turned to the other two and said, how'd you guys do? He said, oh, we did very well, look, how wonderful. Says, wonderful. He took Jim, he brought him up, and he looked at the whole group of people, and he brought Jim in his arms, he says, Jim, you've done the right thing. What do you mean, sir? I don't understand. He let Jim there and he goes in front and starts talking to the people. He says, my friends, I gave these three workers, these three people, seeds to grow. And after three months, as you know, I will choose the next CEO. What they did not know and what you do not know is that each seed I gave them, all three of them, were seeds that were boiled. <laughs> they could have never grown, no matter how much you watered the plant. And the only person that stayed true to what I asked him to do was Jim. The other two bought other seeds that I did not give them, and that's why they grew the plant. What's the point? Jim was faithful with what God had given him, if you will. He was a man of integrity. That's what God is looking for. Will you stand with me, please? We're going to be dismissing after this song. We have fellowship time today. I want to thank you for being here. But before we go in fellowship with each other, 
I just want you just to just stand before the Lord and just say, Lord, does my life please you, Lord? Am I truly living for you? That's all I'm going to ask you to do. I could very easily have you come here and all that. I'm not doing that today. We have fellowship. I want us to connect with each other. But before we do that, I just want you to look within your heart as we sing this chorus a couple of more times. I surrender all to Jesus. And that's what I want you to do if you haven't. I want you to surrender everything to Jesus.